welcome to How Did You Do It, our space to get to know the people behind great ideas. Whether you're on your morning walk, heading to work or relaxing at home, enjoy. Your daily dose of inspiration awaits. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the first How Did You Do It podcast of 2022. New year, new jobs. Gabby's (laughs) 20. She's out of the teens. Huge. So keen. Why don't you tell everybody about Blossom? Oh my gosh. I started a new job, which I'm so excited about at Blossom. I'm so keen. Like, I'm just so pumped, so excited. A new start is always like so much fun and it's really exciting. It's yeah, exactly what I want to be doing. And you, yeah. Georgia? Oh, I was going to say, it's been amazing watching you from even when we started this podcast, your growth, even throughout our journey of how did you do it? And now working at a company that is just amazing and I know that your boss is amazing and anyone who's seen the episode also knows that so super exciting yeah I recently yes as of yesterday accepted a role at UTS startups which is super exciting so we're very in our niche so cool and like I literally couldn't think of a better job for G it's like it's awesome it's up your alley and you're gonna smash it speaking of startups entrepreneurship and all of that Our guest today is absolutely fantastic. He was regarded as one of the most influential young CEOs in the country and named 2018's Forbes 30 Under 30. And he even won an award of Victorian Young Achiever of the Year, which is just insane. So Gabby, do you want to reveal who it is? Incredible. Yeah, we could not have asked for a better way to start the year off, honestly. Today, we sat down with Ash Davies, who is a CEO and founder of Tableau, which is a company that has literally just revolutionized how people publish books. So yeah, you'll hear all about it, but it's absolutely incredible what he's done, just like made it so much easier for smaller authors to publish books and also made it so much easier for established writers to get their work out there as well. So absolutely incredible episode. He hasn't just done that though. Um, (laughs) I was going to say it's like three other companies or four. There is is so much else going on, which we'll get into. And thank you so much for joining us back here in 2022. And we know you'll absolutely love this episode. So enjoy. Hi, Ash. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, guys. I've been looking forward to this. It's good to meet you both and, and finally speak. Yeah, we're super excited to dive into it. To start off, it'd be rude to not ask, considering you have your own publishing company. What is your favorite book? Oh, that's a tough one. I generally lean on the side of nonfiction. I love books that are kind of based on reality where I can uh, learn something. And usually my favorite books are of, uh, you know, role models and icons, people like Richard Branson that I, I always, always love reading. But I have to throw in a plug as well. My favorite book right now is called A Dream Life by Claire Massoud. A uh, wonderful New York Times bestselling author. We've just published her with Tableau as well on our new imprint, Tableau Tales, and that's just come out in the US and UK markets. So her book is is fantastic, and I highly recommend. Biasly, but it's good. <laughs> no, I, I trust your judgment there. Um, we've done so much background research on you, and you're clearly an ideas guy. It seems like there's so much happening, but we kind of want to get to the start of it. So, what was growing up like, and where did your entrepreneurship journey kind of begin? So my entrepreneurship journey that really came from my grandfather. He was a businessman and he, 50, 60 years ago, moved the family over from the UK to Australia and started a company. And that company's always kind of supported the family, small business uh, that's uh, been in the UK and in Australia. But it meant that growing up, I was always surrounded by business talk at the dinner table and I loved it. It just became, because of the surrounding, and that was the real uh, privilege of growing up in a business family, it just became so second nature to think about starting and running a business. And it meant that when I turned 14, uh, I started my first company because it seemed like the normal, sensible thing to do. I really, really wanted a go-kart. I had no money. I couldn't afford a go-kart. I was looking online and I found that I could buy a few go-karts wholesale. I could buy seven or eight. And there were a couple hundred dollars each, like half the price of a full go-kart. So I broke a little little business plan, uh, borrowed some money from dad, brought the go-karts in, assembled them in my family's garage, started selling them online and then made a bit of money and got a free go-kart at the same time. So I've been so lucky growing up in a business environment where that's just been normal. And it's put me in a position today where I own and operate multiple companies. I've really built a portfolio around business. I've never had a normal job. So I'm broadly unqualified and have no real skill set to offer. 
but I've, I've kind of lucked out with the path I've chosen. Yeah, that's awesome. I think your biggest skill set is the way that you can, that lens of business and business models that you've been able to formulate from such a young age. When did you first get into writing and, and have you always been a big reader? I have been. Um, I was more so a writer than a reader. And the writing side of things came around uh, kind of, when I was 17 or 18 and I had a blog, uh, which was about photography. And I, I loved and I still love photography and going out and taking photos. And I created this blog where I would go and take photos and then write articles about how I took them. It was called Photo Guides. And I have this kind of early days of blogging in a way where I had 10 tips and tricks to use this on your camera. And I started podcasting and YouTubing back then and really enjoyed the, the writing and the creation of content. And that naturally went down the path of, well, how do I turn this into a book? As a lot of bloggers and content creators realize, once you've got an audience, publishing is a great way to create a product that you can give to that audience. And as is the way with most writers, I started looking at the publishing industry and realized, Christ, this is difficult. It's so, so hard to publish a book. I needed a degree in publishing. I needed to be rejected by every book publisher. I needed agents. I needed to learn about typesetting, about uh, the editorial process, even just producing and publishing an ebook, which was meant to be this democratized industry that anyone could access was so, so difficult that after six months, I almost gave up because I was used to being able to blog and I was used to being able to pick a theme, write something, click publish, and then my work would be out there. So that really spawned the idea of Tableau. Why can't we make publishing a book, a real printed physical book as easy as going online and publishing a blog? Yeah, it's clearly like a huge challenge there. And you notice this gap in the market. So where did the Tableau journey begin? I mean, were you, you were young at the time? I was. I was kind of 19, 20. I was in my, my second year of university at RMIT. And it was kind of a, it was a, an evolving industry. I was studying media and communications. And it was just at the time in the industry where no one really knew what new media looked like. It was all becoming about blogging and online content and YouTubing. But a lot of the, the course and the curriculum was was stooped in old mediums. And I was working on this idea called Tableau, trying to get my own book published. And at that time, it was, it was a little baby idea. I had like a, a little landing page website that I went on some forums and I sent it to some people. And they would then pay me to publish their book as a way to make a, a couple of dollars on the side. But I just felt held back by, by the studying side of things. I really wanted to just try and learn and see what I could figure out on my own. So I took the leap to then leave university after the second year. And when I was 20, I thought, well, I don't know what the next few years is going to look like, but I think I can build something. And Tableau became the project that I really poured a lot of my time and my energy into. Mm. And, and we've touched on it a bit before, but just for our audience who aren't aware, could you give us a little Tableau rundown of what it is? Yeah, well, Tableau is a self-publishing platform for authors and really we're a modern book publishing company. It's a lot like a Canva.com style of product. I know a lot of people in the graphic design world use it where you can just go online and you can bank your images and you can print them. It's that, but for books. So anyone can join Tableau.com for free, start writing their book, uploading their manuscripts, pick their themes. Uh, they can really work and build their book in the browser. They can preview it all fully typeset and they can just click print and print copies or they can click publish and have their book published to bookstores. So we have a, a global network of bookstores and printers. So your book will be distributed in nearly 40,000 retailers, including Amazon and Barnes and Noble. We have printers all around the world that will print and ship each copy of your book the moment it's purchased. So there's no inventory, but there is global availability and distribution for your printed work. So Tableau is really this, it's a technology company that is now democratizing the real traditional book publishing industry and uh, enabling authors to tick off one of their dreams, which is publishing a book. But as we've grown and as the, the service has really improved and the name has become a little bit more sound, uh, we've started to attract some really wonderful authors who are realizing that it's easier, they keep control, they earn more royalties, there's less risk. So we're starting to attract some really high profile names to Tableau as well. So it's, it's starting to disrupt the traditional publishing world as well. As, as empowering kind of the independent author. Yeah, that's absolutely incredible. Like the access you're giving to people, I mean, especially small authors, but then it's also a great opportunity for more established authors too. 
So you were 20, you had this idea that you said was quite small at the time. What were the steps at building that up and starting to scale? The first, well, it's interesting. And I can share what I didn't do as well, because there are often a lot of people who will talk about ideas and then build robust plans about how to execute them. I had no plan and I had no idea. I had no real funding. I had no business model. I just felt like the most appropriate thing to do was to put a website together and see if anyone else wanted to use it. And the the genesis of it was just a landing page with a jot form form where someone could upload a Word document and they could pay money. And I figured that, well, people are using this thing. The second step to that was through a startup accelerator. And that was my first real learning experience that, oh, other people are doing things like this as well. Like I, didn't, I didn't know that the, the startup scene existed or even that running a business or, or building a technology company was considered a career path. Uh, but I, I applied for AngelCube, which was a, an accelerator here in Melbourne. And then I met seven or eight other people who were building companies as well and thought, well, Christ, why don't I take this more seriously? They provided $20,000 in funding, which was enough for me to find a developer to build out the first concept of a, a working product for Tableau. And the rest is kind of, well, it, 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 the rest is history over eight years. It's, <laughs> it's been uh, an extraordinary ride, but that was really the start. Mm. And how did you find the Accelerator experience? Do you think that's a valuable thing? Yeah, yeah it's, well, an Accelerator isn't going to make you succeed. An Accelerator is just going to speed up the process. So mm -hmm. if it's not going to work, the Accelerator is just going to make it not work quickly. And after 90 days, you can't really build a, a strong foundation business. It's taken Tableau years to really get the right product, the right business model, uh, the right team, the, the right platform for success. So it was fantastic to accelerate my own learnings and build me a small network, which has still built the foundation of my career today. But for Tableau, in a way, it, it wouldn't have mattered what company I went through that accelerator with. Uh, Tableau's idea wasn't quite ready. And it took a couple of years to really find our feet and to, to have a product that today is growing and profitable. Uh, so that's been, a, that's been a journey. So you kind of tested that proof of concept with a really small kind of easy, um, easy to roll out idea. And then the accelerator kind of helped take it off the ground. Um, you mentioned that there's been like a huge change to the product and development. It's been, I mean, it's been a nine year journey. I can imagine a lot has changed. Were there many challenges in kind of like building out a really, really valuable product? Yeah, there are, there are always challenges. And it's why you've got to be a little bit perverse to be a, a founder because there are always things going critically wrong. And you've got to, particularly in the early days, maintain just a sense of calm and grace. And you've got to enjoy and thrive on solving the problems. And that's something that I've always loved. It's like I've been plugged in the wrong way. My worst days, like when everything's going wrong, are the days that I'm like, Yes, I'm fully utilized. I can be productive. I can make decisions. So I love the challenge. Uh, but there are, there are the, the problems even at scale. And as you start to mature in business, the problems don't go away. They just change and evolve into slightly more complex and different problems. It's just like this, this uh, world that keeps reinventing itself again and again and again. You kind of have to adapt to it. Uh, but we've the very first problem that we faced was finding the right product. And then it was finding the right business model. We thought that people would publish ebooks, and a lot of people did publish ebooks at the time. But we had a business model that allowed you to publish for free and then take a percentage. We would take ten percent of the of the sales. And in our business plan, in the business model, we were making squillions. Everyone was publishing. We we're making all this money. We had all these successes. And the thing that started to crush us was the the, the reality of any creative business, where you are you have to publish an enormous amount of content just to find that 0.1% of incredible successes that will fund the rest of your back catalog. And after about a year of publishing ebooks for free, uh, the business was hemorrhaging cash and, and realized that you know, we weren't making any real money at all. Uh, luckily at the time we had also sourced other funding. So about 400,000 in, in capital, seed capital from uh, local and some overseas investors. We just started burning through it. The second thing that we tried was kind of a social network for authors because that was all the rage back then. And we thought, well, if we have big, impressive user numbers, then we must be successful. But it doesn't matter how many users you get. If you haven't got a business model, you're going to, see, you're going to keep running out of money. And it took, it took the company almost collapsing in 2017 uh, 
plus the the extraordinary circumstances of meeting certain people in the print industry uh, and uh, an acquisition that fell through and a licensing deal that collapsed, it took this extraordinary storm of events around that time for us to reinvent around a print-based business model. Most other companies would have stopped or given up three or four times along that journey when things got too difficult. And indeed, most other companies that I come across, whether it's friends or people that I'm advising, they have this kind of 18-month cycle where after 18 months, they realize that things are really, really hard. And what do you do when things are hard? You stop because you're normal and you go do something else. But we just never did that. We just kept trying and building and iterating because we love the publishing product and we love the mission of creating something that we as authors would all use. And it took that introduction of print and the expansion to this global network of bookstores to build a business model and a product that now grows and sustains itself. And now we're in control of our own destiny, which for quite a few years we weren't. Mm. So instead of taking the 10%, it, it's reshifted into providing further services of print? So now it's a, a SaaS-based business model. So it's free to join, and then authors pay an annual subscription to publish the books to mm. stores. So having that reliability and consistency of a SaaS subscription, mm. still providing the product for free, but allowing people to upgrade to reach more bookstores, gave us this foundation where we can now start to scale a business consistently. We know our metrics, and that was a, a, a very new business model for the book publishing industry, uh, where that combined with print, combined with retail services, combined with a services marketplace for editing, for cover design, and a few other things, has built Tableau into a business that's, you know, we've, we've, we've got four legs to stand on, and we've got four pillars to the business model that help us really grow. The most recent of this was an introduction of printing. Previously, we were just publishing, but we've introduced dedicated book printing services now as well. And, you know, we've had some wonderful commentary from authors and uh, even Silicon Valley uh, figures like Paul Graham, who have been using it and printing books for their children and promoting it. And it's just, it's kind of the first time that it's been so easy just to type something or have someone write something and click print and you can hold something real. And that's, that's real special in the print space that you just can't get in the digital world. Mm, totally. And, and what would you say have been your proudest moments along creating Tableau? That's, a, that's an unusual question because it's, for me personally, I, something that I need to do better, anytime something goes well, you enjoy it for a second, but then you straight away recalibrate and start doing something else. And it's very, very rare that after any particular milestone or success, I personally take the time to really think about it, uh, which is a problem. Like, I don't recommend that to people. But I've just always got this unusual hunger to just, what's next, what's next? But the proudest moment really surrounds the people. Um, you know, I've, I've got an incredible team, and I'm so proud to have that team because when you spend uh, – most of your, your waking hours working with them and you've got a great supportive group of people around you who become your friends, you realize that the product of Tableau isn't just publishing. But for me personally, it's my life. It's the people that I spend my time with and the stories that you share with them. So I get all kind of misty-eyed when I think about that. But it's, it's always about people, always. And if you've got great people around you who are supportive and uplifting and hardworking, then it just makes life that much more enjoyable. It's incredible and it, it's so cool what you've done. Um, and it's it's not just Tableau that's been going on in the past nine years. So you've also released a viral fragrance company and you're now, um, you have just launched Hugo's Deli. Like how, where did this all fit into the picture? Like how do you do it? Like so many questions. <laughs> <laughs> the fragrance company, you, you have done your research. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I will typically be running um, uh, really a portfolio of, of four or five different companies. And I, I say I'm running, but usually other people are, are the, the ones that are doing the hard work. But I've always tried to be an entrepreneur who breaks away from that mold. I think a lot of uh, particularly investors will want you to focus on one thing and one thing only. And I know that I, I operate at my best when I've got a lot on and I focus my time on finding great people and engaging them and trusting them and giving them the agency to make decisions. And it means that I'm, I've gotten to a, a point in my career where I can have a few businesses that are running at once. Uh, the fragrance company 
I love because not many people know about, but it's, mm. it's most of those little air fresheners that you see in cars, whether it's like the Beyonce or the Kim Kardashian that's crying or the Kanye. I've got a company called Nonsense that manufactures and sells them. And the majority of them are in the US market, but we have some Australian presence as well. But that all started because my brother and I came up with a, a parody product called Elon's Musk. <laughs> a little picture of Elon on an air freshener, and we devised a scent that smelt like actual musk, and it smelled a little bit like rocket fuel and vegan leather and cologne and a bit of body odor because he works hard, Elon. <laughs> and this went viral. I, I sent out a tweet about it, and I was lucky enough to have a couple of tech editors who followed me, and they thought, wow, this is a product announcement, and then they wrote it up. So we went to sleep, and then the, the next morning woke up, and I called my brother, and I'm like, dude, have you seen this? But it was on CNET, it was on Top Gear, it was on Jalopnik, it was on Mashable. We had some of the now this videos made, and it just went viral. Uh, so we were very lucky to to have that kind of launch, but then uh, adapted it into a company that sells those little car air fresheners all over the place. And most recently um, in the hospitality space, which is a newer industry for me, but something that I'm, I'm, I, I really deeply love because hospitality has been so much of my lifestyle. I love the food and the dining scene, uh, particularly through lockdown. Um, a, a lot of what I'd look forward to is going out with a friend to a sandwich deli and waiting 45 minutes in the sun for a, for a chicken sandwich. And it became such a part of my lifestyle and my culture that as things have started to evolve, that's a new industry that I've started to enter. So I've had a, a sandwich deli called Hugo's Deli that's just launched this past Saturday, uh, just on my, my main street of Swan Street. And that's going to be the first of many, just great takeaway, American style, Rubens, chicken rolls, sandwiches, coffee to go. Um, that's been fun. That's been a that's been a really fun, different kind of product experience and product challenge that's finally out there. And it's like we've got something real on the street because you don't get that in technology where you deploy code and then you've got code live. You've got a building with your, your company's name on it and all your friends are going and people wearing the T-shirt. It's, it's cool. And hospitality is, particularly over the next two years, something that I'm going to be starting to really expand on with different cafes, delis, restaurants. That's so exciting. And was the deli style and the sandwich style, is that – it aligned with your taste and what you wanted or did you just see the the need uh, well there's definitely it's something that because it's on my street and i, I literally mean that it's it's 400 meters away <laughs> um <laughs> you got to put yourself in the context of your own customer where we've got a great head chef a really talented head chef who's put together this menu and it's the kind of industry where you find someone with talent and you trust them with their ideas but then when you're building out the experience and you're, you're trying to curate parts of the menu, the whole team has to really think, what do we want for lunch? What do we want when we go out in the morning? We want a coffee and a little, you know, we don't want a big, crazy sandwich every day for breakfast. We want something that's maybe smaller, lighter. We want a mortadella that's fresh. We want a chicken sandwich at lunch. So we can create a menu that, that, that we like and we think represents ourselves. And we've got to be our own customers and just hope that uh, other people align with that. And so far, it's, it's worked. I mean, we've been open for four days, but we've sold out every single day. We had a, a real queue forming out the front over the window, which was, was stressful, but the good kind of stress because mm -hmm. it, it meant that we had to just be pumping out, you know, multiple sandwiches a minute to keep up with it all. But so far, it's been working. That's so exciting. Congratulations on all the Thank initial you. success in that. And we've so got one coming in Sydney as well. So I'm, I'm moving up to Sydney. I'm, I'm traveling up there soon to find a location. Awesome. That's exactly soon. what I was going to ask. <laughs> oh <my laughs> um, so something that I would love to know after hearing all of this is how do you manage your time? Like what's your kind of, do you have any morning rituals or? Yeah, well, I, I'm becoming a morning person uh, just because there's a necessity now to be a morning person. And I really cherish that kind of seven till nine o'clock block in the morning, right? Wake up. Uh, go work out, go sit at a cafe with my laptop and a coffee. And in those hours, no one's asking me questions. So I can think, I can plan my day and I can structure it. But then my, my days are pretty typically dynamic. Uh, I'll go into Tableau in the offices typically to run and, and be involved with all hands meetings or product meetings. Then I'll go down to the, the deli to you know check on production and check what's happening there. I'll usually try and allocate different parts of the day to different kinds of work. So in the morning, I like to be more collaborative, more hands-on, work on more challenging problems and strategic problems. In my afternoons, it's more uh, administrative, laborious work, presentation work. 
uh, getting on the phone and talking to people as well. So I have to be quite disciplined in, in structuring parts of my day so that I've got the energy to do the right quality of work. It's only possible because I've got a great team of people, a fantastic team of people who I trust. And really, they're the ones who are doing the majority of the work. And it's, it's empowering to me because it's as though I've leveraged my own time by having other people engaged and motivated to work hard on the products and the, the companies that we're passionate about. But you know, a, a lot of people will, will generally ask and question how I do a lot of things. And it's a question of bandwidth. I've always felt and, and understood that if you want to get something done, you ask someone who's busy. Because someone who's used to being busy will do it. They'll get it done quickly. They haven't got the time to do anything else. They won't get it wrong because that will mean they have to come back and do it again. So if I stay busy, that's when I kind of stay on top of my game. If I slow down, I don't think I'd be as sharp. So I, I really thrive on doing a lot. And with the type of work I'm doing at the moment, it's unusual because a lot of the time I still feel underutilized because it's other great people who are making a lot of the, the great decisions. Mm -hmm. So I still feel like I'm, I've got room for more. Um, so I'm just trying to fill my time and fill my days and, and do interesting things that people hopefully care about. That's yeah, really cool to hear. And it's really interesting to hear kind of like how you optimize your days and kind of fit everything in. Um, we've got a young, super ambitious audience. It would be really, really cool to get some feedback and advice um, for them. I know you dropped out of uni. That was obviously the right decision for you. Um, what would you give to a 20 year old, 22 year old in uni trying to figure out what they want? So the first thing you've got to do is not compare yourself to anyone else. Because I've realized this and I've been a victim of this and a, a purveyor of this being young is that people are, will genuinely look at what someone has done and what age they are and think, why are they or aren't they not doing this? And that kind of comparison is dangerous. If you're under 40, you're young. Like the young rich list is anyone under 40 years of age. And I think people who are 40 are really old still. But we've got so much time ahead, so many decades ahead of us where you know, you only need to have one or two good ideas in a decade and people will think you're a genius. And that's what I've learned. I've been in business for half of my life now. I started at 14, I'm 28 now. And people think in a lot of ways that I've become this overnight success because of the, the profile of the businesses, but I've spent half of my life working. Mm -hmm. And that time, that patience is so, so necessary because you know, it, it really took me a good decade to get to the point where I thought, look, I've, I've kind of built something of value. And anyone who's in their early 20s and they're starting and they start comparing themselves to what people who are in their mid or late 20s are doing, it might take 10 years to get to the point where you've built something that you're proud of and other people look at as, as successful. And then they'll think, wow, you were an overnight success. But it, it takes time and it takes patience and it takes passion and it takes grit and hard work. It's a lot of hard work. And usually the the way to succeed with something is to just not stop for a really really long time especially when things are really hard and in order to have the mindset to do that you genuinely have to really love the problems and really care about what you're doing so just be genuine and true to yourself be patient work hard be kind to people build networks of, of great people and surround yourself with people who lift your energy and then just kind of trust that in time it'll it'll work and make sense and you just got to have that faith. Totally. That's such fantastic advice. Um, it's probably some of the best advice we've gotten from any founder we've had on, to be honest. Great news. Love that. <laughs> um, I'd love to know as well, we've kind of touched on it, but what is next for you? Yeah, it's a good question. I'm trying to figure a lot of that out um, because there's, you end up in this mindset where you just want to do more and more and more. And I'm, I'm a competitive enough person to just want to keep doing more. And whatever you're doing, you want to do better and, and grow. And I think that it, it's, it's always important when you align with a certain purpose and you align with certain values. The past two years has, has really shaken a lot of people mentally um, because it kind of makes you think, what am I doing this for? So I just want to double down on, on those values. It sounds so vague and arbitrary, but I just want to make sure that I'm happy, surrounded by great people saying yes to exciting opportunities in life. I just want to enjoy it. Uh, there's no real target per se of taking Tableau to X percent or opening X shops or anything like that. Those are just uh, goals and statistics to kind of ground you at certain points. But I'm really just trying to 
at the moment for me and all the close people around me use the learnings over the past two years to fully embrace and enjoy life because I think that we've we've realized that it's very easy for things to change and I just want to double down on that. It's been so great chatting. This has been such an incredible episode. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, for all the listeners that are wondering, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me on Instagram at Ashdav or on Twitter at Photo Guides, which is a, a relic of my old photography world. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> please feel free to reach out and say hi. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode, guys. Um, we absolutely loved it and hope you did too. As always, you know where to find us. Our Instagram is how did you do it underscore podcast. That's the main place to find us. Um, other than that, we'll be back in a fortnight. Or if you're a LinkedIn user, how did you do it? Question mark podcast. Um, that's our LinkedIn page. So feel free to give us some support over there. I'm excited for more episodes. That. This is so fun. I'm so pumped. I know. So pumped. We'll see you back here in a fortnight. Bye, guys. Roll the outro.